Gotcha. All right, and we're live. Welcome to the Parenthood Revolution, um, day one of the summit. Today's guest is Kristen Rayner, and Kristen is going to talk to us about money. So thank you so much for being here, Kristen. Um, Kristen is an independent financial advisor that focuses on strategy rather, rather than products to create wealth and stability for families and business owners. So thank you again for being here and I'll let you kind of tell your story and how you kind of got into this and then we'll get into like the juicy stuff. <laughs> oh, ooh. The story might be the juicy stuff. Thanks Connie yeah. so much for asking me on. Um, I, oh boy, my story, I'll keep, try to keep that part short. So I um, am a mom of three married to a first responder. We live here in Barrie, Ontario. And um, I grew up in a small town uh, with parents uh, who were both teachers, both elementary school teachers. So in a small town teachers, what that means is that they knew everything that I got into trouble with. So uh, I read a lot as a kid. And uh, one of my favorite books, one of my big impactful moments was reading The Wealthy Barber by David Chilton when I was maybe 12 years mm -hmm. old. And I, I drove my father crazy sitting at the kitchen table saying, do you understand how money works? And do you understand a compound interest curve? And do you understand? <laughs> and um, I remember him being patient with me, but I should probably loop back one day and ask him how, how he survived that. Because having three kids of my own now, I understand <laughs> how, how trying that can be. Um, so I went through uh, school for business and um, actually took human resources. But uh, during high school, I worked with cash all the time. So I started with Canadian Tire and I was a cashier and then I went to the bank. So I've actually been in financial services since I was 17 years old, Wow, which um, <laughs> number is getting bigger, but I've, <laughs> I've been around money um, for a long time. And uh, I, I was in banking up to a management position. I left banking to go into um, pension and benefit design. So dealing with life insurance and how group benefits and individual insurance can really create stability. Um, I was there for about nine years and then took a break from the financial world for about 10 years to raise my three kids who came within four years of each other. So it was a very busy time. I didn't do the math on that one, uh, <laughs> but it, it was all good. They're wonderful. Um, and so while I was off on, on that time with my kids at home, I actually went into direct sales. And so I was a national leader with a direct selling company. I was literally like the jewelry lady of, you know, the Tupperware kind of business model and traveled across Canada, coached women, uh, spoke on stage to train and earn trips. And it was a grand, it was a grand little time. Uh, but that company closed and my family moved out of Toronto to Barrie. And my uh, real estate agent actually connected me with someone, um, his mom worked with National Bank. And so I went and became an advisor back into the banking world after a bit of a break. And what happened there, Connie, was I, I assumed that with the 15 years or so that I had stepped away from that role, that um, things would have changed. And in fact, um, all the parts about retail banking that were trying to me before were even more trying. Um, and so I ended up actually leaving retail banking and going independent into financial services with a focus on um, marrying investment and insurance planning. And so that's what I do now. I'm in my fourth year and uh, work here in Barrie um, on my own and and I have a lot of fun doing that. So that's kind of a very high level background, I think, <laughs> basically in a nutshell, I've always been kind of a numbers geek and um, the money nerd, but that doesn't mean that I always got it right with myself. And when my kids came along and started to get a bit older, I had to really understand um, what they needed to know about money to be successful. And the further I started to dig um, the more I realized that we are not getting the full story about money. We're getting a very marketed, very effectively streamlined package of information, um, even from some of our biggest celebrities. You know, there are a lot of people selling a whole lot of books and programs on how to build uh, wealth and how to create money stories for yourself. Um, and even those are not entirely um, complete. So it kind of became my mission three or four years ago uh, to tell the whole truth. I had this upsetting breakup with what I thought I knew about money and uh, started to really get curious and ask questions. And now that's what I love to do 
is is encourage and maybe even goat other people to start asking questions too. Yes. So you have mentioned that what you believed about money not being true before. So I'm kind of curious if there's like, you know, the top like two or three things that you feel we believe about money that you would like to kind of myth bust. Oh. <laughs> um, well, I think, I think the number one thing is that money isn't math. So when you sit down with a typical financial advisor or a typical financial planner right now, um, what they're showing you is straight line math right? So they say, um, how much do you think you need for your project? And how much do you already have? And how many months do you have to get to that project date? And therefore, we'll assume how much risk you can take on you, the investor, the, the individual, how much risk can you take on with your dollars in order to take a shot at getting to that straight line math number. And anyone who's lived more than a couple of years on the face of this planet knows that <laughs> life does not unfold in a straight line. And so that would be the biggest thing is that money is not math. Money works inside of an economic model. Um, and, and I don't see a lot of financial advisors and financial planners building pictures that represent uh, the squirrely life version that I tend to see more with my clients. And, and I know that we've lived it ourselves. So that would be the number one thing is money is just not math. Um, a great example for that, if you're talking to your kids is, you know, if, if you had two oranges on your kitchen table and, uh, I gave you two more oranges, how many oranges would you have? And straight math says, well, I would have four oranges. And that's true in that very moment, but the curious child or who we could aspire to be as curious, um, individuals is, well, it depends. Um, what's the temperature of the room and how quickly will the oranges spoil? And what if someone takes an orange? And what if one rolls off the table and I lose it? Um, what if I don't need my oranges for 10 years? Will I still have four oranges when I come back? So that's kind of one of those examples that I've used with my kids to say money isn't just math, two plus two isn't four, um, to our advantage and to our disadvantage. Um, that was a long one. What's another thing about our money that just isn't true. I think the fact that we are marketed, especially when it comes to investing and saving um, and building wealth and security, we're marketed to as if the only way to do that is through stocks and bonds, right? The two mainstays of the stock market. And that's just completely not true either. Um, getting to some principle-based economic driven um, strategies will give you lots of other choices for places to store cash and multiply cash and have access to cash and grow your cash. Um, so that would be the, no, that would be my second big one is that that's the market and risk is not the only way to achieve growth and create a future with your money. Wow. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so I kind of want to start back over about oh, no. money <laughs> yes. and why it rules our lives the way it oh. does. Oh, <laughs> well, um, a colleague of ours here in, in Barry posed this question, a question really well, I thought. She had us close our eyes in a meeting and you were in this meeting, so you know what I'm talking about. And she said, um, picture yourself at your kitchen table or in your living room and you're six years old. And what are you feeling and hearing about money? And so when I answered that question for myself, and it's a very personal moment, so it's not something that you need to share with others, but it is something that I think you need to tap into because the control comes from the stories that we tell ourselves about money. And so many of the stories that we tell ourselves are subconscious. We don't even know that that tape is getting um, the play button pressed on it over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it's really important to create this consciousness and this awakening in us right now, as we take responsibility for raising small human beings and, mm -hmm. and, um, and having an opportunity to, to redirect the course that we're on right now. Um, I think if you can get in tune with how money, how money felt when you were a kid, was there always a lot of it? Was there never any of it? Did your parents fight about it? Did you have a parent who, um, you know, 
always did the money and the other parent was very passive? Did you only have a single parent family household? Were you living with your grandparents, which would have created an even bigger space generationally around our attitudes of money? Um, so I think that the control comes from not being tapped in to um, the underlying programs that we have. So doing some soul searching around that. And I also think that our financial institutions and not to pick on them, they create a ton of stability and we all, we need them, but they have a lot of money available to choose and hire the very best of the marketing geniuses out there. And I think a lot of the control comes from us being marketed um, into wanting more and needing more and, and, you know, we don't have advisors right now in the retail banking system that will say, you know, this is how much home you should probably buy. We have, we have computer programs where the advisors say, this is how much home you can afford to buy. And they stretch you all the way out to the very end. And it takes a very disciplined, very tapped in person to say, I'm not going to buy the $700,000 home. I'm going to buy the one for 550 and I'm going right. to redo the floors in two years and that kind of stuff. So I think there's a lot going on. Um, our interest rate environment has certainly created a situation where we are going to quickly lose control if we don't uh, kind of rejig some of the things that we're doing. So there's a lot going on there, but fundamentally, I think it, it starts with understanding your very personal relationship with money and how, right. how you feel about it. Right. And then that story we carry on through our lives and it impacts our, our relationship with money throughout our over. Yeah, so yeah. can you talk a little bit about our own? So once we've uncovered those money stories that we're um, carrying around, yep. what can we do to start to change our relationship with money? Oh, the first part is probably the hardest, right? Getting real and down to the core of the story that's playing for you is probably the most difficult part. Um, after that, I think you need to ask yourself what you want. And again, it, it requires a bit of, um, I don't know, I think we've celebrated for a couple of decades now, we've celebrated um, the having of things and mm -hmm. we have backed off celebrating um, delayed gratification and discipline and because none of that sounds sexy or fun, right? right. Like what right. sounds more fun, redoing my kitchen or being disciplined to wait five years? I mean, come on, like, <laughs> or, yes. you know, really. <laughs> um, but I, I think that understanding your story and then finding someone that you can work with who shares your values. So that's another place where I see mismatches where people um, go to experts or advisors or professionals and if they don't seek out those underlying matched values that people have. So if discipline is a value that I hold and I match myself with an advisor um, who doesn't personally hold discipline as a strong value for themselves, then they're not, we're going to be in this exercise of frustration a lot of the time because the advisor might see that I have the time to take on more risk, right? Or I've got the income to take on the bigger mortgage Whereas my own values are getting rubbed up against saying, no, I actually value just slowing down and being steady and, and being safe with my money, things like that. Mm. Um, so figuring out your story, figuring out your core values, and then deciding what you want and whether or not you're willing to do what it takes to get there. And I think when one of the biggest parts of that is understanding that you and you alone are responsible for your financial education. It's not happening in our schools the education that we get from our parents is a lot through osmosis and not a lot of um, right. critical thinking. It kind of seeps into us for good or for bad. And uh, we have to decide that we're going to be a hundred percent responsible for our own financial path. And that's, that's scary. <laughs> right. And how can we start to educate our children about it and teach them about money? I think the number one thing, and I get a lot of people who do not like this answer, um, but I think the number one thing that we have to start doing is talking about it. The conversations have to take place. I know when I, when my kids were little, um, I started talking about money in ways that they could understand uh, with Lego. So my kids, we talk about money. We have thousands of dollars in Lego if anybody needs. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I wish there was a market for that stuff, but um, Yes, but I used, you know how the Lego blocks come with, you know, two bumps or four bumps or six right. bumps kind of stuff. 
and you can build really big things the more the more blocks you have um, but we would start talking about a, a, a two bump block you know versus a six bump block and and we would do little trades and barterings right so if 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 abby had something that noah wanted i would say to her well you know how many bumps would that be this must sound crazy out loud but anyway <laughs> the kids started to understand that there was a mechanism in place for us to acquire things that we wanted and that it meant letting go of something that we already had, which I think is a concept we need to start with with our children. But um, also I started seeing personalities in my kids really young, which was super interesting to me. So I would see that Abby, who's my middle one, she's 13 now, she hates money. She hates yeah, the financial expert. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like being a lawyer without a will. <laughs> but but in all seriousness, it's it's funny because my eldest is a, a boy, 15, so he's in grade 10 right now and just getting into debit card access and all that kind of stuff. He has a very distinct personality about his money. Abby has a very distinct personality and relationship with her money. And then our youngest, who is 11, has another third kind of of flair to her relationship with money. And so I think it starts with the conversations, but through those conversations, you'll get access to your kids um, on their own underlying um, pulse with, with money and currency and, and being able to hand something over and letting go of one thing in order to have something else. And how does it feel after you did that? Uh, that's where I think we have to start. So- interesting. I encourage people to give their kids real money. So I know I said I started with Lego blocks. So I'm talking when they were like two, three, four. Um, right. But you can, you know, a five-year-old, a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, there are jobs that they can do around the house. They should be compensated in some way for that um, or can be. And then, then they have real money that they can have experiences with. And when they want something, you can say, well, if you make $5 a week, how many weeks would you need? You know, there's a math lesson there. Right. And, and do you want it badly enough to save for three whole weeks? And what else could we do? And I always had my kids, you know, my kids have a rule that 50% of any of the money that they make goes away for long term savings. The other 50% is for their discretion, they need to decide what they're going to do with that. Um, but really just they need tangible opportunities. I always took my kids shopping with me. I always told them, you know, apples are a great example, right? I love honey crisp apples. So the kids, <laughs> the kids learned quickly that if they grocery shopped with mom, they'd get the really good apples. But if they grocery shop with dad, they'd come home with Macintosh or yellow delicious. <laughs> <laughs> so we all have our vices. Um, but there are a lot of conversations just in day to day life that we can be talking about, right? Looking through the flyers, meal planning, involve your kids in that, let them know what's going on um, with your money. That was a long answer, but did that answer your question? It did. And yeah, what okay. about the, so I'm interested in the conversations around money because when my daughter and I talk about money, it is a, because I don't want to install the same scarcity mindset, I find that I almost kind of like bypass her in the sense that I'm like, oh, okay. oh well, there's always lots of money, right? Like I say, like, yes. like things like that, that I don't yeah. necessarily believe or mean. But I, I say them because I don't want her to feel like contracted when she comes to money. Yeah. And you're just so tapped in. You, you've got such a busy, busy brain. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, that, that one's tricky. That one's tricky. And I, you and I have had this conversation on a personal level, right? Where money, for a lot of people, money is energy, right? And so it flows to you and it flows away from you. And that's, I mean, that's a personal economy too. So that's a concept that we can understand. Um, I, this one's tricky. The scarcity mindset is something that um, it, it's like a cancer to a lifetime, in my opinion, but that doesn't change the fact that um, at any given moment, you may have a limited amount of funds or resources. Right. And so I always try to add, um, when I'm speaking to the kids, um, like, you know, yet, right? We we're, on, we're not in a position to buy that yet, mm. or um, we're still working towards so that there's, I, I hope that for my kids, that's creating kind of this balance and buffer that says, um, you know, yeah, we can always go and make more money. 
And the more I'm willing to go out and seek out opportunity and learn to get better and help more people, the more money will flow into us. But A, we need to make responsible decisions when we have inflows so that unexpected outflows don't flatten us. Um, and, and there is a reality that right now, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. I don't want to teach my kids that. Right. But at the same time, you, the reality that we live in in our physical environment right now says that there is, there is a limited amount in our bank account today. Right. So I guess that's my answer is I, I try to soften and round it out with, we could make a plan for that, which teaches mm -hmm. my kids that, you know, the impulsivity and the consumerism that drives us a lot of the time, we need to kind of tether ourselves back a little bit. Let's make a plan right. for that. Um, we're not quite there yet. We're making good progress, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. And it creates a little bit of space, I hope between the, I want that and I'll have it because credit says I can, or because I've right. got money in my pocket to burn and what other things are important to me that I may want to take, you know, account to 10 on this for a second before I hand over my cash. Mm. Those kinds of, those kinds of conversations I think are important. Are any of your kids spenders? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Abby, so Abby, that middle one, she's a spender on big, big stuff, big stuff. Okay. So for instance, she's in love with this BTS group out of South Korea, the K-pop. They're even growing on me. I'm hearing that <laughs> in her house. Um, and she just spent $400 on tickets, two tickets to go and see them. Wow. So she's a spender when her values are really, really aligned. Um, and she, sa she saved for two years knowing that that was going to happen which is a okay. really long time when you're only 13, right? Like that's right. a sixth of your life. That's a yeah. long time. Um, my middle one, no, that was my middle one. Sorry, my youngest, uh, she loves to spend money. But interestingly enough, she loves to spend money on other people. So mm. when she earns her allowance, she'll say to me, you know, do you have time that we could go to Booster Juice? Because I'd like to buy you a smoothie. Aww. Or can we go over to wherever? Because I want to get my friend Adele whatever the hair scrunchie she saw so that she knows that I love her right um so she's a spender but it's not for her own consumption and she prefers to spend on other people and on on experiences with other people so that's really kind of cool and then my eldest was not a spender he has the biggest savings account um and hasn't even started working part-time yet However, we've come into an interesting little chapter now that he's at high school and we got him a debit card. And so he has a certain amount of money that's in his checking account that's accessible in the debit card. And he himself has started saying in the last couple of weeks, you know, I, I need to, can you remind me to make a lunch because it's getting too easy to just tap my debit card at school. And I didn't oh. realize how much money I was spending. So and to go back to what we can be doing with our kids, I think giving them physical cash is really, really important um, because again, all of the electronics that, and, and all of the ways that we can now move money around, we're so separated from money. In fact, I'll tell you a little story if I've got time. Do I have time for yes. a little story? Yep. <laughs> so we took the kids out East last summer uh, on a driving trip for two weeks and we were in old Quebec city. And of course it's summer and it's hot and it's, you know, everything smells good. And Noah wanted a milkshake. So we went into this little ice creamery thing and, and can I have a milkshake? Can I have a milkshake? And I looked up and I said, I said, uh, no, no, I think, I think we'll just get some water and, you know, maybe we'll have drinks or dessert when we go out for dinner tonight. And he kind of looked at me like, are you kidding me? And I, I, he said, well, I said, look, you've got money, right? You brought some of your own money and we gave you each spending money. Um, Abby came home with all of hers, that middle one. She didn't part with <laughs> any of it. She's so funny, but, um, Noah said, okay. So he went back into the shop to get a milkshake with his own mm -hmm. money. He came back out empty handed and I said, what happened? And I'm thinking maybe he got nervous and he didn't want to, you know, do the cash thing by himself or whatever. He came out and he says, I'm not buying a milkshake. They're eight bucks. I said, really? <laughs> he said, yeah. Are you sure you won't get me one? I said, yeah, I'm pretty sure. So, so, so interesting that it wasn't a big deal for me to spend $8 on a milkshake, but his own money that he had to part with his 20 and now only get back 12 and that whole thing, he was not having any of that. 
Right. <laughs> so again, they, they need, I think we need to give them dollars, dollars that they physically hand over and don't get any back to have the experience of, oh yeah, I just, you know, I got that for this and this for that, but I kind of liked having money in my pocket. Um, and I think we have to, I had to let him burn through a bit of cash on his debit card at school in the cafeteria, which just about killed me. But um, he needed to have his own discomfort around that. Okay. Um, yeah. It's, yes, I have spenders. In my house. <laughs> so it's funny that you're, you mentioned your youngest one loves to spend on other people. My daughter's yeah. the same way. And um, it's her love language, right? That yes. even yesterday she's like, mom, she was rude to me in the morning. She's like, mom, can we go to Starbucks? I want to buy you a drink because I was uh, so mean to you this morning. But um, she uh, is the type of kid that as soon as she gets her like birthday money or any kind of money, yes. she wants to go and spend it right away. Yeah. And so I'm not sure how to help her to understand. So that I've said like 50% has to go into your bank account. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure how to help her to understand that she doesn't need to constantly be buying stuff because it's, it's junk food. <laughs> so oh, it is. Always, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a really common one for, for kids, like our kids age, right? Because it's, yeah. see, there's a lot of autonomy that comes with having money, right? There's a lot of control that is regained when you have some money. And I think it's important for our kids to get um, introduced to that because I mean one of my missions in my business is to create more autonomy within families and within businesses because the more secure they feel the more likely they are to expand their business or to donate to charity or to give their time right so the more stable we can create a basis in our in our family the more stable our community be which creates a more stable country blah 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 so I think kids need a taste of that I I I encouraged my kids to pick projects or um, or something that they really wanted to do. Like this is how Abby got so set on not ever spending any of her money was because she found something that she loved so much. Uh, Noah was the same way when we introduced him to archery. He really wanted to save up for his own bow. So I think sometimes having a project or something that's a little bit out there, even if it's um. You know, if you if you bought tickets, if you bought the tickets to take Abby somewhere um, and, and she was really going to want to buy a T-shirt, you know, then she would have a reason this Saturday not to spend all her money because she knows that in six weeks or in a few months, which is a long time for some kids, you might have to shorten it up. But but giving them a goal to say, oh, I know a Starbucks would be so great today, but let's remember how much you want to be able to get that t-shirt when we go to see ABC at the concert in, in May right. um, and trying to get them to hold back a little bit and, and using examples for yourself, right? If, if you say, you know, mom really wants some new, I don't know, special makeup or something, and it's not the kind I usually get, but it's twice as much. And so this week, I'm not actually going to go to Starbucks or I'm not going to do this. Just starting to demonstrate um, that just because you're the parent and the adult doesn't mean that you don't have to exercise the exact same muscle of restraint and discipline and have them engage you with that. One of the things that worked really well with, um, with my youngest was for me to share my goals with her. So I would say to her, hey, can you remind me this week that because dad and I are going out on Saturday night with friends, I don't wanna buy coffee on my way to work, not a single day this week. So can you partner with me and remind, and then she's like, yeah, mom, I'll remember <laughs> the time. And she set reminders on her iPad in the morning, it would get up oh. and, and, you know, so I think if, if we normalize the fact that we can't have everything we want right in this minute, right. but the delayed gratification of looking forward to that t-shirt she buys or my dinner out on Saturday night so far outweighs the coffee that I went without that week. Right. You know, little right. does she know that we always have fresh coffee on at the office. So, it wasn't <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but that wasn't the point, right? right. Um, engaging it and normalizing it a little bit to say, well, sure, you, you could, you could have both if you want, but maybe not all in the same week. So you kind of got to decide which one turns you on more. Oh, interesting. Thank you. One more question. Well, a few more questions, but one more question around <laughs> the whole family thing. So the reason why I wanted to have this conversation to yeah. kind of kick off the summit was because 
for even like in my own life, money is a huge driver, right? It's a like challenging and rewarding kind of thing in my life. And so, um, but one of the things that I find, and I'm not asking you to do some marriage counseling or anything, but <laughs> is, is that <laughs> how can we have open conversation when we're conflicting with like even our spouse, but yeah. still making it a normal conversation within the house? Wow. <laughs> like, do you um, and your husband see eye to eye on your money? You no. Know. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> no, we, we have worked, Matt and I've been together almost 20 years. Um, I think, yeah, 19 <laughs> years, 19 or 20 years. We can edit that part, right? Just yeah. <laughs> um, and, and no, when Matt came into, when, when Matt and I came into a relationship, we probably talked and figured out our money stuff last and in hindsight and knowing how much I know in my head, we should have figured that stuff out first, but there's a difference between what you know in your head and what you live in your heart, if that's not too out there for people. So um, getting knowledge to, to travel south into your heart and to live from that place is a very different exercise. And it's the number one struggle that I see with families. And I think, I think um, to get it right with your partner, you really, really have to be prepared to take responsibility for your own stuff. So it goes right back to where we started, Connie, right? With understanding your money story, understanding whether you save because you have a scarcity mentality, because you're always afraid there won't be enough, whether you spend because you don't feel like you're worthy or you don't feel like there's enough, or it's a distraction for you from the other areas of your life that are hurting. Um, you know, there, there are so many different dynamics and I would encourage people to, to do the work for themselves, but, but partner with someone who can guide you as a couple through those um, conversations, because the tools that you have, whether you're speaking about parenting or your physical relationship or, um, or money, you know, those are interchangeable skill sets that you can use in every single area of your relationship. So I think it's a, it's a really big one, isn't it? It's a really big one. Um, Matt and I kind of came to it from a place of, I, I relied on the responsibility we have for our kids, which maybe have been a bit of a cop out. I, it should have been enough for me to just say, this is important just if it was only ever you and me. Um, but I used the excuse that we had children and that I didn't want them. I wanted them to start from everything that I know now and not live everything I live to get to where I am. It's much, how, much similar to how I feel about my clients, right? I don't want you to have to go live 46 years <laughs> of, of what it's taking me to learn what I know. I wanna start you from now and, and give you a bit of a fast track. Um, so the conversation has, you got to figure out, you've got to figure out your money um, dance with your partner. And that means you need to know your part and you need to hold him or her responsible for his part. You know, that movie where it's like, this is my dance space. That's your dance space. Right. Yeah. If you want to move in rhythm, you've got to do your own work and then learn the moves together. Awesome. That is an amazing answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay. So in the talk that I don't know how many people in like listening to this call were yeah. in, you mentioned like three ways to get more curious about your money. And I was oh. wondering if you'd want to share those. Yeah. Here. <laughs> yeah. I love, I love challenging people. It's the Irish in me, or maybe it's the Aries in me. I don't know. Um, yeah. So in, in that talk, we were talking about um, the fact that math isn't money, that saving is not investing. Um, to not confuse products with strategies, right? That's the talk mm -hmm. you're talking about? Yeah, yep. okay. So yeah, some of the questions that I get people to ask is um, simple things like, if you understand that a bank makes some of its money on interest, right? They pay you 1% to leave your money sitting there and then they charge me for to borrow it out for my mortgage. Most people understand that much of how banks make their money. Um, then ask yourself why? If a bank makes money on interest, why would they encourage me and allow me to pay my mortgage down early and save interest, right? That was one of the questions I think we yes. had. And um, I don't know the answer. 
Are you? Are you? Um, another, another good one is the government, right? So in Canada, uh, we have, an, and in the States, there are 401ks and around the world, we all have um, similar products. But in Canada, we have a retired, a registered retirement savings plan, which I actually think should be called a product, not a plan, but anyway. Uh, and so I encourage people to say, you know, why would the government encourage you to not pay your taxes this year? All of our governments run on tax revenues, right? That's how they pay our health care and fix our roads and the whole bit. So if that's their income stream, why would they allow us to not pay our taxes this year if we put money into these savings programs? Why would they do that? Where are they going to get the money from otherwise? So um, things like that. Things like, why are they done like that? How are they done? What are they thinking that they would create these advantages for us, right? And I always refer to it as the glossy side of the brochure. So all of the, all of the benefits to an RRSP in Canada are really pretty and glossy and hammered down our throats. Um, but there are two sides to every story, right? I'm lovely and charming and bright, but my husband would give you the other side of the story <laughs> if he were here. I'm also capable of other things. And the RRSP and all these different strategies, paying down your mortgage, you know, only by term insurance. That one, Drake, just makes me absolutely crazy. Um, there are two sides to every story. And so you need to be flipping over the brochure and asking an advisor to point out what, what's the downside to the strategy. I understand the advantage, but what would the downside be? And if I didn't do this, what else could I do? And why would I do it versus something else? So just asking more questions. And I know that that's really challenging in an environment where we are all busy. We've got a ton of information coming at us full time. Uh, but again, I circle back to your financial future is 100% your responsibility. There are good people who can help, um, <laughs> but, but, but it's 100% your responsibility. To educate yourself and figure it out. So start with asking why. Be a two-year-old. Why? 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 Awesome. All yeah. right. So thank you so much for being here. How can people get a hold of you? Oh, you can find me um, at where can you find me? <laughs> you can find <laughs> me on Facebook. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. So it's Kristen Rayner, R-A-Y-N-E-R. My Facebook page is My Awakened Prosperity. So it kind of captures the story of my own love affair, hate affair with uh, what I've learned about money. You can find me on LinkedIn just under my own business name and you can reach me at 705-718-1039. Uh, awesome. All right. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And thank you to everyone who watched. <laughs> Cheers, everyone.